In March of 2015, the last chapter of the Attack on Technodrome saga came out, a chapter that was merely a setup for the next arc. But the news of Donatello's apparent death made such big shockwaves that even mainstream media took notice. Ironically, Tom Waltz, who wrote the story, was caught by surprise the following day when USA Today was on the phone asking for an interview with him. But as is usually the case, whenever comic books make the newspaper pages and morning shows, it also caused a backlash from fans of other iterations that weren't up to date with the comics. Donatello's death was so shocking that it even affected the loyal readers of the book, with some dropping the title and shouting at the clouds. But were they right? Did they kill Donatello to boost sales? The then CEO and co-founder of IDW, Ted Adams, joked with Tom Waltz one day. He asked him to kill another turtle after seeing the tremendous amount of advertisement it made for the book. But as I said, the impact of Donnie's death wasn't intentional. It increased the stakes and made readers feel that no one was safe. Nickelodeon clearly understood this, and they supported their decisions. For the most part, the attack on Donatello was an idea that came from Bobby Kernow, the then editor of the book. They were planning their way into issue number 50, and one of the reasons for it was to do something new with Metalhead. The death scene was just a means to get there. Then again, if you were really into comics, the news of Donatello's apparent death was old news. In January of that year, Diamond printed preview pages of that year's free comic book day special, a chapter that you could classify as 1.5 of the Vengeance Saga. They weren't supposed to release those pages, but they did and they spoiled the end of the Attack on Technodrome story for many. But enough about the real-world drama, let's dive into the follow-up story and epic conclusion of the first 50 issues, Vengeance. After dealing with Krang, the Fugitoid returned to Earth and the Turtle Lair, where he found a seemingly lifeless Donatello. But with his own senses, he detected Donatello was still alive and asked them to put him in a cooling unit to slow down Donatello's cell metabolism. Knowing his son was probably on his way to the afterlife, Splinter meditated into a higher plane to bring him back to the land of the living. There, Donatello saw his mother again, Tang Shen. She told him that he had two paths to choose from, the warm light where he would find consolation, or the dark path where there was still knowledge to be discovered, the knowledge he was clearly seeking. As he was making the decision, he was found by Splinter, who guided him back to the dark. But after waking up, Donatello found himself inside Metalhead while his body was in a coma. Meanwhile, Karai had to deal with the apparent death of the Shredder on the battlefield and took the opportunity to strip the clan of all the vengeance-driven schemes the Shredder had going. She took control of the clan with the idea of swearing off outsiders and bringing their lost honor back. But Shredder, as you may remember, wasn't dead. He was rescued by Baxter and was healing while being held captive. Baxter offered him a business deal that Shredder had to accept or be dropped from Baxter's penthouse by the Flyborgs. A lot was going on between Casey Jones and Hun in this and the previous saga that didn't directly affect the story, so I'll leave those for other videos. What you need to know is that April and Casey would leave the city and travel to the American Southwest, searching for clues to the existence of the Pantheon, something they learned about from a stolen scroll that belonged to the Foot. Back at the Foot Lair, Karai, Koya, and Bludgeon were shocked by the return of Orokusaki and Baxter Stockman. Shredder took power back immediately and reinstated his plans for vengeance, going against Karai's principles. Stockman quickly deployed an army of Flyborgs and Flying Mousers throughout the city to find and destroy the Turtles and Splinter. The Flyborgs found the Turtles in no time. With the Lair compromised, Donnie Tella transported his body to Burnow Island. With that out of the way, the Hamato clan escaped through the water and ended up cornered on a bridge. There, they received some help from Alapex and Nobody. It seemed then that the Hamato clan was about to fall, fighting for their lives. But then they received the surprising help of the Foot Clan. It was a group led by Karai, who disapproved of such a dishonorable tactic. Back in Burnow Island, Fugitoid and Harold had a tough choice to make. Saving Donatello's life required disconnecting one of the Utrons in stasis. But fortunately, Leatherhead showed up with the canister of ooze to save the day. Don't worry about the why, 
that will be a topic for a future video. At the foot layer, Shredder was furious at Karai for interfering with his plans. She brought the Hamato clan with her, and Splinter challenged Saki to the gauntlet, an ancient ritual to resolve their feud. Being the survivor he was, Baxter decided to get the heck out of there. The first part of the gauntlet was Disciples Against Disciples. The Turtles would fight against Bebop, Rocksteady, Koya, and Bludgeon. At the start, it seemed like the evil mutants were winning the fight with their chaotic way of fighting. This was when Splinter told his sons that to control the battle, they needed to control themselves. This worked like a charm in bringing some order into the fight, but they were still pretty hard rivals. During the fight, Leonardo defeated Koya by cutting her wings, and Donatello eliminated Bludgeon by blinding him. But there was still the issue of Bebop and Rocksteady, and after what they did to Donatello, the Turtles had good reasons to fear them. Instead, they started using one against the other to try to knock them down, but this tactic wasn't working either. After receiving a communication from Burnow Island, Donatello said goodbye to his brothers and self-destructed, weakening Bebop and Rocksteady. And the fatal blow would come from Donatello himself, with a brand new shell and metallic bow staff. He knocked them down, and the Turtles won the challenge. The next level would be at the rooftop, but Splinter still needed time to find clues on how to defeat the Shredder from the Astral Plane. The Turtles fought against Shredder, but couldn't really win that fight. Splinter would finally find the necessary clues and start fighting Saki with his son's weapons. Splinter reminded Saki of an old lesson they received from their former master, Masato. He told them their most primal impulses would be either their boon or bane. For Yoshi, this impulse was his rage, but he learned to control it and channel it appropriately over the years. However, Saki's primal impulse was vengeance and it clearly became his bane ever since the day Yoshi turned his back on Saki and the Foot Clan. Using his rage in the battle, Splinter fatally wounded Saki, defeating him. Saki decided to die as an honorable warrior by performing seppuku. In his final moments, Saki finally understood what caused him to go unhinged and tried to make peace with Karai and Kitsune. After killing himself, Splinter beheaded him to finish his agony. Karai decided to go to Japan and offered the clan's throne to Splinter, who became the new Jonin of the Foot. This was something that unsettled Michelangelo. He couldn't believe that after all this time of fighting the clan, they were becoming a part of it, to continue with all their crimes and assassinations. He stormed off the place, which would trigger several ramifications for the book. Seeing himself as the new master of the clan, Splinter remembered a moment from his past life when Yoshi and Saki played in the forest and dreamed of becoming great masters one day. This saga ended with a flashback to feudal Japan, moments after Shredder killed Yoshi and his sons. General Krang saw this and assumed that the clan going out of their way to kill them had to be something extraordinary. So he sent Chief Science Advisor Mariel to collect DNA and QNA specimens from their bodies and this was probably the key to Splinter and the Turtles' mutation centuries later. Vengeance was the conclusion of many storylines that started with the very first issue of the book, and it started many other stories that would lead to City at War and the 100th issue of the comic book. It remixed events from the original comics and made its own spin on the cycle of vengeance of the Mirage continuity. But this time, Shredder performed seppuku on himself, and his beheading was an act of mercy. However, by placing Splinter as master of the clan and continuing their status quo, the book would go into uncharted territory for a while. Koya and Bludgeon would eventually return, overcoming the injuries they acquired in this story and even marking Leonardo forever. As you may already know, Shredder died for a while and stayed in hell until he was brought back to life, but that's a long and complicated story for another day. Many plots that were left unfinished in this story, like the Pantheon, are still ongoing and a vital element of the current Armageddon game. And speaking of current comics, Donatello's original carapace would eventually resurface during the Mutant Town saga, becoming Venus's shell. She didn't have a shell before because she wasn't an actual turtle, but that's also a story for another day. With Splinter being the Foot's leader, the turtles would go through an identity crisis and a new character would become Splinter's Chonin, Jenica. 
Check out this other video to learn about her story.